So now we're going to start the second presentation on the auxiliary field the quantum Monte Carlo performance by Professor Assad. He stopped yesterday um, at the point that's being shown yet already in the screen. And um, yep, so we're welcome, please, Faka. OK. So hello again. Um, so let's continue the lecture we started yesterday. And I'll continue. I changed a bit the organization um, so as to um, you know, stay sort of on time for the project um, suggestions. So um, we're going to start with the organization of the code um, and discuss the fast updates. And I'll tell you here, you should understand why the code scales. If you want to have one sweep at beta times the volume to the cubed. Uh, then we will talk about the projective um, approach. And then we will spend some time on project suggestions. And I don't think that I will be able to start um, this global updating scheme um, section on Langevin dynamics. So I, maybe we'll stop here today and finish all this then tomorrow. Good, so, so how does we can um, sort of recapitulate what we had yesterday? So we will calculate, we want to calculate an observable O, an arbitrary say equal time observable or time displaced actually observable. And yesterday we spent some time showing that it's in, an integral over, so there's a bracket here missing, but it's an, an integral over a field of space and time dependent, an action and the fermionic determinant B of L tau to B of phi one. And then the expectation value, that's what of the observable O for a given uh, configuration. So that's what Johannes talked about today. And then we divide by the partition function. Um, we have Vick's theorem. That means that if I know the Green's function on a given time slice, so this is this object here, G of phi of tau, then I can use this, right? So this is defined here, I can use this Green's function on this equal, on this time slice to calculate any observable using Vick's theorem. Good. So, so now what we have to do is doing the sampling and a, um, you know, to sum over all the field configuration. And the easiest implementation of the BSS is to just do a single spin flip, so a sequential sing, single spin flip um, upgrading scheme. So what we do is that we pick a time slice. We don't pick it randomly. We go sequentially through all the time slices. I'll tell that to you afterwards. And then we just change a field locally. So if this is an Ising spin, we just flip its value. If this is a continuous field, we could then shift it by a, a given with a given probability distribution, box-like distribution, and get a new field. And what will happen is that if I change a field phi at site i and imaginary time tau, then essentially I will only change this B matrix, right? So don't, don't remember that this B matrix, you can write it here, this B matrix of phi of tau was equal to E of minus, I hope I got, I think I, of phi of tau, this is the interaction in E of minus delta tau, the hopping, right? That's what we had defined um, yesterday. Good, so we will only change this B at a given phi, at a given position, um, um, tau and space. And if we just take change it at just a given uh, position, then essentially we can write this change as one plus delta B of phi and tau. Now, what, what happens in general is that at least for the case we were discussing um, yesterday, this matrix phi is diagonal. And that means that this um, delta, which I have here is a very, has only one non-zero element. And if I try to, if I write it like this, X, y, then that's basically delta x has to be equal to i, y has to be equal to i, and a number which encodes the chain. So it's a delta is an extremely sparse matrix. So what we will have to do now, so this is, this is the change we do when we do the single uh, update. And what we will have to calculate for the necropolis hasting um, updating scheme is that the, the ratio between the new weight, which is here, this one plus delta, divided by the old weight. And um, you will see that there's just a simple set of algebraic, algebraic um, manipulations you have to do to see that, well, the, the, the action here, the S0 action of the, the dynamics of the field that you have to, to, um, to, to specify, that's an easy calculation to do. And then what is left over is the determinant of one plus delta times one minus the Green's function. 
So what is interesting here is two things is that the greens function is really the central quantity of the algorithm, right? So if you, if I give you the greens function on a given time slice, then you can calculate any observables and the greens function here will also determine the metropolis, the metropolis um, updating or will you know, define it, will determine the, the propagation or the evolution of the Markov um, chain process. So that, that's very important. So to take away here is that G is, the, is really the central quantity. So how do we practically implement this? Well, we do it this way. So this is schematically, we have, this is, let's say it's a one dimensional lattice. So this would be uh, the lattice, right? On time slice one at imaginary time one. And then we just basically, um, you know, replicate it on all the imaginary time slices here. We have 10 uh, time slices. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture we have. And on each of these points here, we have a field, right? So that's basically the field phi of, this is I, and then phi of I and tau is equal to one. Here. So we have a field on each of these points. And what we will do is to go sequentially like, like, like this um, through uh, the lattice and update sequentially all the fields. Going sequentially through all this is very important because that's the, that's the way you can get um, a good scaling beta times the volume to the cube. If you try to put in some, you know, some um, random updating scheme in this method, it will be a catastrophe. Right? It will be very, very slow. Um, so this is, this is what we want to do. So let's assume that we have to start somewhere. We will start on time slice tau equals one. And let's assume that I have computed the Green's function at time slice tau equals one. Computing the Green's function is not so easy because it's an ill-defined matrix inversion. We'll talk about this later, but in principle, I can do this um, in um, a time which scales as the inverse temperature times the volume to the cube, right? So you can, if we go, go back, you can see this right away by essentially you're, you have to multiply all these B matrices, these B matrices are volume times volume. So you, when you multiply matrix volume to the cube, and then you have to you have to do this beta time or L tau times, and then you do the inversion. So um, even if you calculate a brute force, you will get um, this scaling, which is beta times B to the cube. The stabilization will not make this worse. So that's that's important. Good. Then I will pick up. So I have my I have my Green's function now positioned on this time slice one, and I will essentially choose one point here and then flip. The, the field or you know update the field and then I have to calculate the ratio right so so um, the, the the ratio for for the metropolis facing acceptance rejection scheme so so again my delta is very is very very simple I mean my delta only has an x what do we say delta of y i and times eta and so this determinant here can be calculated right away and this determinant is one plus essentially eta and then one minus G on at position I. So there's a tau here, which I have not to forget, one plus eta, one minus G of I, I. So you see that calculating the ratio, if this is not expensive to compute and if it's generically not expensive to compute, calculating the ratio doesn't cost anything, right? It's basically, if you have the Green's function, the ratio is, is, um, is, is very, very cheap. So now, um, if the mood move is accepted, right? So then I, I throw a dice and I see if the mood is, move is accepted or not. If it's not accepted, okay, then I don't do anything. I continue to the next field. If it's accepted, right? So I continue to the next field. If it's accepted before moving on to the next field, then I have to update the Green's function. Now updating the Green's function would be crazy to do it, you know, from scratch because that would cost you beta times B to the cube. And for this, we have these, uh, what people call fast um, updating uh, schemes. So um, assume that I have, I won't go through this in detail. These are, you can go through, through the notes uh, we have with Hans Gerd. This is done in, in, in a lot of details. But um, so I would like to calculate this quantity here, right? And I in fact have um, the, the Green's function, that's the case before the upgrade, that's when delta is equal to zero. And um, what one can use, essentially, this is um, because delta has only one non-zero entry on the diagonal, then you can use um, Sherman-Morrison formulas 
which is given by, by this equation. And what this tells you is that if I um, know the inverse of a minus one, so that would be my original Green's function, and I change the um, a by an outer product, so this a, this outer product u, outer product v, if I take this as ij, that's equal to u of i v of j. Um, and so, so if I just change it by an outer product here, minus one, then I can calculate um, I can calculate the, the, um, the A inverse after, after the change in actually, if A is the N times N matrix, then this is an N squared operation, right? So that's all, that's, that's all, that's all I need. Um, so you can recast this form into this, this uh, G here with the delta into such a form here. And what you will get is exactly just plug things in and what you will get with this form of delta here, you will get exactly um, uh, the new G of, for the new field G phi prime of tau is equal to the old one, which you have stored on your disk and you have to calculate, you have to calculate this. So Z that's essentially fixed, right? Because that's exactly the position when I'm, that was my I before, sorry. So I changed to Z. That's the position when I'm doing the update. And you see that if I want, I have, for each X and Y, I have to calculate this. And that gives me, as I said before, operations which scales as the volume to the squared, right? Because X goes over the whole volume, Y goes over the whole volume, and Z is just fixed. So you see that if I take this Ising spin or this field, I update it. If it's accepted, then I have to pay a price V squared, okay? Now, um, I will go through the whole real space lattice and on average, let's say I have an acceptance of 50%, then to update all the fields here, then I have a V squared per field, but I have you know 50% of the fields still. So I have a V squared times V, right? And that gives me, if I want to update on the time slice, then that will give me, sorry, times V, there's no V squared here. Oops, I'm not very tidy this morning, this afternoon actually. This gives me a V to the cubed, okay? So to update all the fields on the time slice, I need a V to the cubed, right? So that's, um, that's good. And now how do we go on? We finished updating things on this time slice. And so we have to go on to the next time slice. Of course, we don't want to recalculate the Green's function because that would be too expensive. So what I want now is to go to the next time slice and, um, um, and have, before I start updating on time slice two, I would like to, what we call, wrap the Green's function from tau equals one to tau equals two. And then that gives me, um, so that's my G of tau plus one. So what happened is I have a tau plus one here instead of a tau. And here I, I go from L tau back to tau plus two instead of a tau plus one. And that's, you can see this directly. You have, just have to multiply by this B matrix on tau plus one the old green function, which we already have, and V minus one here. And so this is an operation, which is, you know, normally we have checkerboard, so that will be V squared. Even if you don't have a checkerboard, that would be something like V to the cube, right? That would be a matrix of multiplication. So that would be a V to the cube. And so, so you see that for each of these elements here, right? And to wrap it up from here to here, I need V to the cube. I will have to do this, you know, I will go up to the end, Right, so that will give me a, a um, beta. I will have to have, so I have V to the cubed, right? And I will wrap it up and then I have to do this L tau times, but L tau is like beta, right? L tau, that's, that's the, the, the number of operations I will have to do for one sweep. So that's basically V to the cube times beta because beta is proportional to, to L tau. So we will go up from here to here, from one to 10, and then don't forget to, to measure observables on the way, right? When you go, when you wrap up. And then at the end, you essentially have your green function at uh, this position at the end, at your last time slice. And you can just go back, right? Then after all you will do is then to, you know, there's like a snake which goes from one to 10, and then you go back from 10 to one, and then you repeat that. So, so one sweep, you know, in the code, we have, we have this notion of sweeps and sweep. So a sweep for us 
is basically what I just, a sweep is, is going, essentially going from, we start from L tau equals one to L tau. So sorry, we go from tau equals one. It goes from tau equals one to L tau, and then from L tau to back to tau equals one. So actually there's a factor two in the definition of our sweep. Our sweep is basically going up, visiting all the spins, and then going down, visiting all the spins, and that's what we define as a sweep. Okay, so that's that's how that's how it's done in the code. Good. So that's um, that's it, right? And so you know we will go up and down um, and just continue sweeping. And you know the sweeps are accumulated in bins. The bins are written down on disk, as Johannes told you showed you for the for the energy, for example. And then we analyze everything um, with other um, routines, right? Anna dot out, for example. Okay. I will go on if there's no interruption. And I will go now to uh, projective approaches. Projective approaches. So this is um, a, a better way if you want, if you're interested in ground state properties, right? That may be a better algorithm for ground state properties. Um, the idea is then to, um, to, to uh, so this is what we want to compute, right? And what we will do is to start with a trial wave function. So in the code, we have the possibility of having a trial wave function on the right, which is different from a trial wave function on the left. So that can be useful. And um, we will re require that this trial wave function should be non-orthogonal to the ground state. And you will agree that if I have this condition and also if I have a small gap to the first excited state, then when I propagate this trial wave function along the imaginary time, then here, the, um, the, the eigenvalue with the smallest energy, because I have a minus, will dominate exponentially um, with respect to the others. So essentially, when theta goes to infinity, then I will um, have a calculated this, a, um, this expectation value. Okay, so tell me if it's not clear or not. Um, there are a couple of points we have. You will see that um, we have something a bit, uh, we have done something looks a bit ad hoc, but it's, there's a reason for this. So we have here theta, which we call a projection parameter. Parameter. Now, the idea of the projection parameter is when I'm here, then I essentially have the ground state, psi zero. And the same thing happens, happens here. So here I would have the psi zero. So theta is never infinite, but it's big enough so as to be sure within the error bar to have projected out the ground state. And then I have a, a small interval here, which is, so, which is denoted by beta, and I can do my measurements in this beta interval, right? So the total propagation is two theta plus beta. Theta on one side and theta on the other side is there for to, to project out the ground state from the trial wave function. And this um, interval beta in the middle is an interval where you can measure. For example, if you want to measure time displaced correlation functions, then you can only measure them in this interval, right? Beta interval, and you will, for example, here only be able to measure uh, the ground state properties of C dagger of, let's say, beta and then C of zero. That would be the maximal time displaced correlation function. So if you want more, you have to enhance this beta, okay? So, um, so that's what it's that's what it is done. Now, to implement implement this, we need a couple of um, further constraints. One thing which is um, first important to to um, to realize is that well, you can um, there is always a gauge choice or phase which I can choose of defining a trial wave function, a wave function. So it's very convenient to avoid a not a sign problem, but it would look like a sign problem. Um, to avoid a sign problem, it would, it's very convenient to choose a trial wave functions left and right such that the overlap is bigger than zero. So that will be taken care of in the code automatically. There will always be a gauge adjustment if you want to. One of the trial wave functions will be multiplied by a phase, but that this is always bigger than zero so that you don't get a minus one sign, for example, without any fluctuation. Good, so there's another constraint. 
um, the ground state, the, the, um, the wave function has to be, this psi t has to be a Slater determinant, which means that the Slater determinant, we would also, we would like it, this psi t has to be a unique ground state of a non-interacting Hamiltonian. Okay, so for, um, so as we, as there was a question this morning, for example, we could take for the Hubbard model, we could just take HT. HT, for example, uh, could be the um, no, non-interacting case, something like this. Now, you just have to be a bit careful. You have to um, do something to the boundary. I'll come back to this later. You have to do something to the boundary conditions so as to be sure that this um, ground state is non-degenerate, right? So you may have to put a small twist. I'll come back to this later. So um, there are many choices for the trial wave functions. If I take, um, if I take um, this one, that will be the ground state, if you want, of the, of the, um, sort of the non-interacting case. If I, if I put in, if I'm sure that it's non-interact, it, that it's non-degenerate, then this would be a wave function which would have um, S squared of psi t would be a spin singlet, right? Would be zero, that would be the case. Um, so this, this would be a very good wave function. You can take on the right side, you could take this trial wave function. And if you have a half filled Hubbard model, uh, for example, and you know you have magnetism, then on the, so that would be on the right hand side, you could take this trial wave function, which is generated by this. And on the left hand side, you could essentially take a trial wave function, which would be a nail state. So the trial wave function, which would be a nail state, that would be the solution of, um, I would just sum over all the i's and a minus one to the i, and then essentially um, a z of i. That would be, that would be a, 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 nail, a nail ground set. That would be actually a, a rather good thing to do because on one side you have a spin singlet, which you should have for the half of Hubbard model on a bipartite lattice. And on the other side here, you would have um, the mean field solution, which would be a nail, nail state. Okay, so that would be Yes. Okay, there's a question. Why should you care about the degeneracy of the trial wave function? Later. I'll come back to this later. Okay. I'll come back to this later. Um, so um, uh, I'll come back. Yeah. So let me let me go on. So so now um, is this a new algorithm or is it the same algorithm as as what we discussed before, and um, especially for the sign problem, etc. So to to recast everything in the same form as a finite temperature code, what you can do is to, um, to, um, to realize that you can define a projector, right? So if I have, these, if I have this Hamiltonian, this non-interacting Hamiltonian, and this non-interacting Hamiltonian has a, a unique, so that's again important, has a unique uh, non-degenerate ground state, then you will agree that if I take the limit theta going to infinity of this operator, so this would be the ground state of this Hamiltonian, then this is a projector onto the ground state. Okay? And this point, that's exactly uh, where, where things become important to notice is that exactly at this point, this is, this is an equation which is valid only if this Hamiltonian has a unique ground state. Okay, so is that okay? Tell me if that's okay or not. You can ask a question. No question. So that's a part projector. And then when I have this, then I can I can essentially um, I um, I write my define a z of theta, which has exactly the same form as the grand canonical. So here I would have um, this projector onto the left trial wave function. Here I would have the projector onto the right trial wave function. And if I take theta going to infinity then I get exactly, right? If theta go, when theta goes to infinity, then essentially what I will have here, I will project onto the right trial wave function, trial, that will be left, trial left. And then here I would have a trial right and a trial right here. And because I'm taking the trace, this will, um, this, I can take this on this side you know, put this on this side, and basically this will cancel, this will cancel with this and this, and what I will get is essentially what I want. 
So this is very nice because provided, right? Again, provided that the that the, this has a unique a ground state, then I can you know go and use exactly the same code, right? Or do exactly the same formalism as I was doing uh, before, and um, for the finite temperature, and go through the whole mathematics, and nothing will nothing will really change. So that's a it's something formal. We never work this theta here, this big theta. So there's a big theta and a small theta. This big theta here is taking to infinity before we, we before we um, start the code. Okay. Good. So um, the reason for the non-degeneracy, I, I think I, I repeated it quite often, um, is that um, I would like um, this this relation which I have here, right? This relation which I have here only works between this and what I would program here only works if this is a non-degenerate ground state, right? Now, if I, so that's okay. Now I can use all the, all the theorem, theorems I have for the sign problem, which we had defined, discussed yesterday for this uh, ground canonical trace. And, you know, if H of T have the same, you know, has is symmetric under time reversal symmetry, for example, if H is also symmetric under time reversal symmetry after the hubbard stratonovich transformation, then I would have uh, no sign problem. And this symmetry, you know, will hold, um, this, the symmetry will hold up to when, will not change if I have going theta going to infinity. If I have a non-degenerate uh, trial wave function, then this identity will not, will, will, will not hold. So if I have a degenerate trial wave function, if I have a degenerate ground state, and essentially what I would have to take is that this I would have to sum over all the degenerate um, states here with an M here and an M here, right? All right, and then I would have to do use this as a trial wave function, which would make something much more complicated, okay? So the bottom line is that if you're not careful with the degeneracy, then you may um, generate a, a negative sign problem, right? Okay. So, so how do we, how do we um, um, code the trial wave function? It's like, it follows like this. So we have uh, our Hamiltonian. We take our, a, single, a single body um, Hamiltonian, um, H of T, and then we just essentially diagonalize it with a unitary transformation. So this will, I will call this my, my gamma. So it's given here. And this is then um, something which is then diagonal. So these are the single particle. Um, eigen, eigenvalues. The ground state psi t is um, is the Slater determinant. So I have I have to sum from n equals one to the number of particles, and then I create this state gamma hat of n on the vacuum. My 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 energies lambda one to lambda n dim. That's the total dimension of the one part particle state. They are ordered in, in ascending order, right? So this is really the ground state. If I go from one to number of particles, and then if I go back to the to my C basis in which I do my calculation of the Monte Carlo, then what I just use, I mean, I define gamma here, and so I can use the inverse to define my gamma here, right? So essentially, the um, the trial wave function is defined by a matrix which is called P, right? And P. So if I have these, this is basically p is um, p is a matrix which goes from um, x and n, and these are the the first um, n um, rows of the u matrix. Okay, so that's what is defined in this uh, in this uh, for this projector. And we have a type which is called a trial wave function type, which essentially um, encodes or defines this uh, projector. I told you that degeneracy was important. We have to be sure that the ground state uh, is degenerate, right? It's not degenerate. And so what is written down in the info file, the info file gives you information over the whole run is what we call a degeneracy. And this is essentially the eigenvalue, uh, the energy for the particle plus one minus the energy, single particle energy for when the nth, nth particle um, energy and this has to be bigger than zero. So what is written in the info file is typically something like this. The degeneracy of the, the right trial wave function is 0 0.47. I think this was for a periodic Anderson model. 
and the, I use the same trial wave functions for the left and right, so it's exactly the same degeneracy um, for the right. Okay, so please check when you use your when you use your um, the the the, um, um, the projective code. Please always check that the degeneracy is bigger than zero; otherwise, you may run into problem. Right. So essentially, uh, I'll repeat it. Um, if you if you don't if you don't have a degenerate if, if something is degenerate, then all the arguments we have to to uh, to argue against the same problem uh, can fail. They must not, but they can uh, fail. Um, there are uh, things which are important. Um, you can use um, to define the trial wave functions and everything. You can um, you can use these this this formulation if you want. That's very useful. Um, a Hamiltonian here to define the trial wave function, etc. Um, but at the end of the day, you will always take the limit theta going to infinity, as I told you before, um, use before starting the Monte Carlo. And um, if you look at the determinant formulas, et cetera, then they have to be a bit modified. And uh, so this would be the equivalent of the partition function when I take theta going to infinity. And it has essentially the same form, but here it has a P dagger and a P on the right. So this is actually a, a, a much smaller matrix. So, so P dagger, P of P right is a, is a, is a rectangular matrix, which is, um, this is the number of particles. This is the, the dimension of the single particle in beam, we call that, so that's, and then here I have all my B matrices. So this is something like this, so sorry. This is a square matrix, which is n dim times n dim. And so then, then the right, the left trial wave function is something like this. So this is n part n times n dim, right? And this will be I m. So this is a smaller matrix, which is essentially the number of particles times the number of particles. Okay, so that's 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 what that's what we have all here. It's a smaller. Um, there are the, the Green's function um, can be calculated um, also by putting in a source term as I showed yesterday. And um, it has um, this form. This is, this will be, this is um, an important, that's actually a very, very nice and elegant form. Um, so essentially um, it's given by one minus this U bigger, U smaller, U bigger, minus one U smaller. And the U bigger is defined as start from the right trial wave function and propagate it to imaginary time tau. And the u smaller is say, start from the left trial wave function and propagate it from the biggest time, two theta plus beta uh, two tau, okay? One very important form, one very important um, consequence of this Green's function is that you see that you will see, that we'll see tomorrow that the scales can be forgotten, right? So you can, um, you can throw away all the scales in the projective code and that makes it much easier and um, at least from the point of view um, um, from the point of view of uh, stability. Jefferson is telling me that I'm already four minutes over time. Is that correct? Jefferson? No, that was a mistake. That was a this was a mistake. Um, okay. You can ignore that. You still have twenty five minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. So one one thing which is which is very interesting in the in the for of the, the zero temperature Green's functions that's a projector. So you can if you calculate g squared, then you will see that it's essentially equal to g, right? And so this is this is something which um, which one can use to define a very nice way to calculate time displaced correlation function in, uh, in the projective code, et cetera. Uh, if you think in terms of, of single particle physics, the Green's function is nothing but the Fermi function somehow. So the Fermi function is, um, you know, the Fermi function of epsilon of K. Um, if you're at zero temperature and you have something which is non-degenerate that this is basically equal to zero or one or the state is occupied or not occupied, and so, of course, the Fermi function at zero temperature is also a projector because zero squared is equal to zero and one squared is equal to one. So this is something you find again in the projector that the G squared is equal to G. So that, that, is, a, that, that is actually very useful. It also tells you that 
if G is a projector, then uh, G invert does not exist. That, 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 that's a problem if you try to invert, if you take your zero temperature code and you try to find the inverse of G, then you will have a core dump normally because it doesn't exist because projector, you can't invert a projector. A projector. Let me give you an example, which, which I find very nice. And that's the, the, um, the difference, the, the comparison between finite temperature and a grand finite temperature and zero temperature code. And so this is, this is the energy. Let's just think about this. And this is the energy for a six by six lattice uh, as a honeycomb lattice. Comb, and um, it's a small U, so it's still in the semi-metallic phase. And I chose this on purpose. We have two different trial wave functions. So there is one trial wave function, which is this one, which we call Kikule. So the Kikule trial wave function would be, um, I, I start on the honeycomb lattice and on the honeycomb lattice in the Brie one. So this is the lattice. This is the Brie one zone. If I have a six by six lattice, right? This is the Brie one zone. Then I have the nodal point, which is part of the K space discretization. So if I don't do anything to my tight binding, right, Hamiltonian on the six by six, then I will have a degenerate trial wave function because this point will be, you know, I can occupy it or not, I can occupy it with a half. So what we do here for the Kikule to, to lift the degeneracy is to put in some, uh, uh, some, uh, um, some a, a mass term, which is essentially a Kikule mass. So this is just a tiny, the T here on these bonds is a tiny bit bigger, so that would be, the next one would be something here. I'm sorry. The next one would be here, etc. Right. So these I just put the, the red ones are a bit small, bigger, and the, the blue ones are now a tiny bit smaller. And this opens a mass gap gap uh, uh, for the for the Dirac's and um, kills will 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 will, will uh, essentially um, I, um, I solve this problem of degeneracy. The other thing we can do. Um, is to a, uh, um, put a T prime, right? If you put in a T prime here, right? Between a very small T prime, so we're talking about very small perturbations. If you put a T prime here, so essentially you, the T prime breaks the C3 symmetry of the lattice and the K points stop, start to, uh, the two inequivalent K points or Dirac points stop, start to shift um, towards, the, towards the, the gamma point and thereby you will also lift the degeneracy. So you can see that you can take the two trial wave functions. So these are these light blue triangles and light blue circles, and you, you really don't see any, any difference, right? It's really also for the kinetic energy. There's a bit of difference for the kinetic energy, but essentially these are those two things. Now, is, the, is it worth doing zero temperature code, the zero temperature code for this? And how should we compare things? And you see that you have to go to extremely low temperatures, right? So this is the finite temperature code here. That's, so what is, what is this scale for the projective code is, let me make this bigger. This scale for the projective code is one divided by two theta T times beta T. So for the projective code, we fix, fix beta equals one. So we average over only beta equals one in the middle. And then we change theta, right? We change two theta, so that's the total that's a projection. And so when we project, we get to some smaller and smaller energy. And then we do the same thing with the finite temperature code, which is this one. And uh, we vary beta. So we make beta or the temperature smaller and smaller. And you see that when you do these calculations, you say, oh, I have to go to very low temperature. So that's, uh, this is going up to 100, I think beta 100. That's rather low for a six by six lattice. And only at these very low temperatures, beta 50 or 100, you really have convergence between the two results. And the, the reason for this is, is pretty nice is that um, the grand cannot, the, the finite T, finite T, the, the, the finite T, uh, the finite uh, T code is a grand canonical code. And the uh, canonical and the, the T equals zero code is a canonical code. And then you can only get on a finite lattice, you will only get um, the, um, the uh, you will only get the same answer below an energy scale where the charge fluctuations go to zero. So you, what this plots here is basically the temperature and these are the charge fluctuations. And you see that you have to go down to extremely low temperature scales, which are of the order of you know, this here where, where I convert 
where the charge fluctuations start becoming exponential because of a small finite size gap before the two codes um, give you uh, the same result. So, so the, the, the aim of this comparison is, yes, things work. If you use canonical or if you use um, a, a finite temperature ground canonical, you should get the same result at very low temperature on finite system sizes, even on finite system sizes, since on finite system sizes, generically, you will open up a small finite size gap and the charge fluctuations will be, will be um, you know, will go to zero and, and canonical and grand canonical should be the same. Okay, so this is, um, this is a, a, hard, a hard comparison. Good, so now if there are no questions, are there some questions for the projector code? Perhaps there is one that's yeah. been already solved in the chat in part by Johannes, but which might uh, you might have something interesting to yeah. comment. If there is an advantage um, in choosing different trial wave functions for left and right, and uh, the example Johannes gave was when you're close to to uh, uh, okay, for example, you yeah. have a metallic side and the other one is you can say Johannes. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, Welcome. Yes. Yes. So you can have to. So, so I, I, I can get the. Yeah, so I, I was just uh, asking uh, about the trials, right. and uh, uh, I think this is something that one can actually play with, right? Of course. Of course. So uh, the reason you choose two different trial states is like uh, what Johannes has replied to me in the chat box that it can. It will not bias to the any. So you see, you, you have you you can you, when you choose a trial wave function, you have mm -hmm. two, you have two possible you have two tr strategies, right? You have one strategy which is symmetries. So you say my ground state, for example, has s squared equals zero. Okay. Yeah. So let's say let, let's say I know this. So I'd like to choose a trial wave function which has a ground which has which is a singlet. Okay. So that that would mm -hmm. that would make sense, and then you. You're orthogonal to all the spin one, spin two, spin, you know, higher yeah. spin excitation. So that's good. But then you may tell yourself, well, this is not so good because um, the overlap, maybe that if I take this trial wave function, the overlap with the with the ground state may be not so not so big, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could say, well, if I want to optimize the overlap, then what I could do is to try to do um, or take a nail state. That's the idea behind the other one, to take the nail state the Psi nail, right? The nail state may have a bigger overlap, right? Maybe this may be bigger than the overlap between Psi zero and the Psi T, which would be the S equals zero Psi T, okay? Okay, so that's a, that's a conjecture. So then you will have to ask yourself the question, what is better, symmetries or overlaps, right? And there are maybe two things which contradict each other. Now, the idea of, 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 of doing, um, the you know, left and right, which is different, right? So we could take this one for the left and this one for the right. Then you have the, you, you have the, you, you somehow have the best of two worlds, right? On, on one side, you optimize the overlap and on the other side, you overlap the, you optimize the symmetries, right? Okay. So that's something which yeah. can be done. You, you can play with this actually. I mean, that, that's a possible project. I, I actually never tried. To, to, to play with this uh, systematically and to see what converges quicker, let's say a path of other one. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I just have a very simple idea that if we are, you know, if we are, uh, see, if we know that uh, we are in a neo uh, phase, then maybe it's better to use, uh, you know, the perfect neo trial state for both sides, right? No, no, no because the nail state is not a singlet, right? And so the nail yeah. state yeah. is a so you have a, so that's very bad because assume that you have a spectrum which is this is the ground state and you have mm -hmm. very low lying s equals one states right yeah and the next s equals zero excitation is very very high if you use, oh, okay. if you use the nail state then it will have an overlap of this bunch of states and it will be very mm -hmm. hard to project out. Mm. Okay. Whereas if you use the, the singlet, then there will be no overlap to this. So you can- oh, then, uh, the, the projection power for both sides are the same, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Then how, uh, maybe, uh, okay, how, how can, can one make sure that it's all projected to the ground states? 
uh, what is the same projection power? So then you have, have to, then you have to, you have to, you have to go in, you have to, you have to test things. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. There's, no, there's no, there's no, so, so this case, basically the, the in, in this, in this example, the low, if you want to, um, I mean, this example, um, you see that to get the same, to say, to get the ground state for this finite size, you have to go to very low temperatures because the low lying states are related to charge fluctuation. Right? Okay. And then you have to get rid of all the charge fluctuations to really converge to the ground state on this finite lattice. Right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that is, um, so you have to try. You really have to change the projection parameter and try. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So now I have, um, I have a maybe, what, 10 minutes, quarter of an hour left, more or less? Mm -hmm. Exactly that. And so I'll go quickly through. So this is, these are just suggestions of pro projects so that we can, we, we can work together on them. And so, so every question you guys ask is a project. I mean, so who you asked the question of, you know, how, how well can you converge with different trial wave functions? So that would be a project. I mean, that would, um, so you can define your own project yourself. Um, and so, but you know, we have some projects here which are part of the exercises and can be, can be done and, and are you know, sort of classical many body physics. Um, and so one, the first one we already talked, that's on, that's in, I think that's, um, that's an exercise, um, odd even length ladders, Hubbard, Hubbard models. And um, this is based on, on, on I mean, so surprises from the weights from one to two dimensional quantum manics. I mean, so odd leg ladders have a spin gap, um, even leg, no, odd leg ladders have no spin gap and the even leg have a spin gap. And so there is an odd even effect when you go from 1D to 2D. Um, what one can do also is to um, uh, more systematically, that, that's, that's rather interesting. Um, this is the, if you take the Heisenberg, Heisenberg model, or if you take an SO3 nonlinear sigma model with a theta term at theta equals pi, then the, the low energy, the fixed point or low energy effective model for that will become as a higher symmetry, which is an SO4 symmetry. And this SO4 symmetry um, tells you that the spin-spin correlations decay, that decay is one over R with a, with a modulation and there's a logarithmic correction, which I forgot here. The kinetic energy, kinetic energy correct um, a correlation should also decay as one over R with a different log correction. And the dimer dimer correlation function should also decay as one over R. So this is an exercise which you can do and then you can continue this exercise by um, you know, doing a more challenging uh, exercise and is really to calculate this correlation function and show that this correlation function has the same asymptotic behavior as this one or this one modulo some different logarithmic correction. So that's very interesting. And this, has, this exercise is, is not so easy. Uh, Toshio Sato, who, who, who's here, um, did that in this article in supplemental material. You can talk to him if you want some help for that. But that's a, it's a cool exercise to check that this emergent SO4 symmetry is really, is really there. What I can also suggest are um, um, SUN Hubbard models. I mean, all our codes um, are, are defined for SUN models. So you can um, do the SU2 Hubbard model on the one dimensional chain. If you go to N equals four, um, I believe that the N equals four Hubbard model has a dimerization, right? So you will go to, you will find a, a dimerized spin gap state. What you can also do, um, if you look a bit in the, in the notes, um, you can, if you take the strong coupling of the SUN Hubbard model at half the link, then you will um, come to an SUN quantum antiferromagnet in the self adjoint antisymmetric representation. And this is possible to um, simulate, to write a code to simulate this in the ALF. And um, you can inspire yourself from the condo lattice. We have an SUN condo lattice code um, in the ALF, which um, has exactly this interaction built in. And you can inspire yourself from this, um, um, uh, um, from the documentation and the part on the condo lattice model to, uh, to, to do this, right? So that will be uh, one possibility. So SUN quantum magnets as a function of N, uh, you can see different phases, dimerized phases, um, and also magnetically ordered phases. Then um, I, um, uh, other possibilities, we have a maxent in the, in the program package. 
Um, and um, it's documented in chapter 10. So you can go over the documentation and, and tell us what is not understandable. And we can help you, of course. And you can, you can, you know, you can do some classic one-dimensional physics. Um, if you take the Hubbard model, this is half filled, U over T equals four, beta T equals 10. These are simulations on, on 46 um, sites. Then um, you, you know that uh, the spin dynamics of the one-dimensional Hubbard model um, has a two spin on continuum. So, so the, the picture is that if I start with um, an, a, 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 a Heisenberg, a, a nail state, and I decide to take the spin and flip it, so that was up and now I put it, I put it up, that's the flip, then essentially I will generate um, two domain walls, right? So if I, I, can, I can do, this can go up, and this can go down. And so you see that I have here a domain wall and another domain wall. These two domain walls are essentially my spin on and these spin ons because there's no string, right? So I'm in one dimension, these spin ons are asymptotically free. And so you should get, when you look at the spin uh, structure factor, you should get some type of two spin on continuum, which you see very nicely here, right? Something like that, which you see very nicely here. So this you can do and, and get it out, get, get it with the, you know, get at least this two spin on continuum with max n, test our implementation of the max n, test, compare it to what you have and tell us if we're better or you're better, et cetera. So you can play with that. Um, same thing if you take an electron out of a, um, of a one dimensional um, Hubbard model, it's an insulating phase, then this single electron decomposes into a spin on, into a hole on. And you have this typical spin charge separation of form of the single particle spectral function. So this would be the spin on, and this would be something like the hole on, right? Which, you know, et cetera. So you can, you can, you can really see um, this fractionalization of, um, of a hole into two different entities, which are the hole on and the spin on uh, in the single particle spectral function. And here the, um, the um, charge densities, right? They are gap because that's an insulator. Uh, so everything is, there, there's, there's nothing at low energies. So you can do that, understand how to use the code to produce these nice uh, pictures. And uh, also what's important, understand the quality of data you need to be able to produce this. This is done by the book. So, so the calculations ran, I think, a day on 24 nodes. So, so you need a bit of power for this. The, co the covariance matrix is taken into account, et cetera. Okay, that's another possibility. Um, how am I doing on time? You can do correlation effects in churn band when, on, on quantum spin hall insulators. Um, so what I did here is to propose uh, one model which is easier to program than on the honeycomb lattice. This is a pi flux model on a square lattice. Essentially what, what, what we have is that this is the unit cell here. This would be my, this would be my unit cell here with two orbitals A and B. And um, every time I hop along this, this lines, I require a phase a minus one. So this is this pi phase. And then you see that if I go over any plaquette, I, I acquire a pi, a pi flux, right? So this, if you, you can use um, our square lattice to do this and um, they, they, uh, this will generate Dirac fermion. So this is exactly the hopping which you could implement. Um, then what you can do, so these are Dirac's system. What you can do is to um, uh, put in a, a mass term and the mass term here would be uh, a Haldane mass term in each spin sector, but with a different how they mass gap or a different churn number plus for the spin up minus for the spin down. And this here that would open up a, um, an, a quantum spin all insulator, right? So this, this will be this Dirac plus this quantum spin all mass term. That's a, that's a topological insulator. Then what you could do, so that's, that's one particle physics. What you can do is then to put in a, a Hubbard U term here and the Hubbard U term can be um, positive or negative. If it's uh, negative, right? Then you will have no sign problem because you will no, not break any sort of time reversal symmetry after the Hubbard Sutanovich transformation. And you can dope this and try to understand what happens to S-wave superconductivity in topological bands, which you can make flat or not flat. So that's what um, uh, Johannes is working on in this, in this article. What you can also do is to put a positive view and you will have a sign problem only if you forget this chemical potential term and you can see um, transitions between the quantum spin hall insulator to a, a magnetically ordered phase, which is which falls actually exactly in XY universality class. So these are things we did here um, some time ago, but but which are which are which are fun to do, and you can play with topological insulators. 
What you could also do, so this is for periodic boundaries. What you can also do is to use um, a open boundary conditions along this, right? If you lose, use open boundary conditions, then you will have on the edges, because it's a topological insulator, you will have a helical uh, liquid. And uh, with the Harvard U, right? Attractive or repulsive, as you like it. In this case, you can look at what happens to correlation effects um, um, on the edge, right? I mean, how does the helical liquid change? How do the correlation functions of the helical liquid um, on the edge change as a function of U? So this is a pretty involved project, but the building blocks are there, right? It's a, it's, I think that um, if I don't have to debug this, I can program this in two hours. Then I have a, a month to debug. But, uh, but in, pr in principle, it's easy to do. Then uh, that was a question which was raised yesterday. Um, so sticking issues. Um, so we can consider an attractive Hubbard model at finite doping. And um, what I told you yesterday was maybe not completely correct. Um, you can use two types of hubbard Chotonovich transformation. So the one which couples to the Z component of spin or the one which couples to the density for the attractive Harvard model, both of them will give, will not generate a sign problem, right? So we can, that is, that we can show with time reversal symmetry. And um, what uh, would be interesting to look at is to see um, what, how does the autocorrelation time change for the particle number? So what is, um, what sticking issues mean? Um, I know that if you use this, um, this formulation with the field coupling to the density, then if you want to calculate n of mu, so you're a gram canonical, you give mu and you want to calculate n of mu, then when u is big, so big, I don't really know what it means, but let's say u is like ht, then you will have some issues that the, this will have a very, very slow dynamics, at least with this code, I know this. And the question is, um, a, a Johannes, told, Johannes tells me it's quicker, I never checked personally, but I'm sure he's right, that n of mu would be much better uh, if you take uh, this uh, decomposition. So that would be an interesting project to have and to check just on the attractive Hubbard model, right? Um, that sticking issues on the attractive Hubbard model is, is a well-known well -known problem, the single spin, single spin flow. Then um, many more things, right? I mean, you, uh, you, can, you can look at uh, um, quantum phase transitions, maybe the uh, for non-quantum phase transition, maybe the easiest one, which is highly non-trivial to get good exponents would be to uh, look at a, um, a TV model on a honeycomb lattice so that you could, you could do, that's what I have in mind, C of I, C of J plus Hermitian conjugate, all right? That will be the hopping sum of all the IJs, um, nearest neighbors, and then a minus V divided by two. So I'm writing it in the way um, where a, uh, you can, you can simulate it without a sign problem, C dagger of I, C of J, plus Hermitian conjugate squared. I'm sorry about this. So let me do this a bit better. Oops, I went too far. Here it is. I'll put it here a bit, maybe a tiny bit better. Plus Hermitian conjugate squared. And then um, if you care to expand this, then you will get, I think, a V N of I minus one, N of J minus one. Correct, I think that's, that's correct. So um, for spinless fermions, if you care to expand this squared then you get a density dense interaction. And there's a critical V where you, uh, where you generate when V gets very big, then you get a charge density wave where basically you have a solid like this where there's an electron which is here, right? And this transition from the semi metal to this Ising um, order, right? That goes um, under the name of Kosnova transition. Um, what you can do is also con consider a, um, a honeycomb lattice, a bilayer honeycomb lattice, and the condo model on the, on the honeycomb lattice. So I will, I, the, the, the model is uh, or somehow already programmed, right? So you can just you will just ask yourself the question, how to, uh, um, how to pick up long range order versus no long range order. Um, this, is, um, this is certainly something which at least in, um, which, was, um, which was interesting since um, I'm finished, Jefferson. I just see that you're telling me to, to, to stop. I'm, I'm finishing right away. Um, so this is, this is 
we know the answer now. The answer is that we have a magnetic insulator and a condo insulator as a function of J, right? So that, that we know the answer. A couple of years ago, uh, people like Patrick Lee were saying that there was maybe a spin liquid separating those two, those two phases. So, so that's, that's something which can be clarified rather, rather easily with the, with the Monte Carlo. You can implement, you know, propose your own project. I mean, you can tr try trial wave functions, different trial wave functions. There was the question during um, the, four, the other session to implement a Zeeman magnetic field. So, so take the Hubbard code and implement a Zeeman magnetic field. You can implement a Zeeman magnetic field on this honeycomb lattice. And actually the physics is pretty interesting since you will uh, generate a, um, a, a transition uh, from a semi-metal to a canted antiferromagnet. So, so this, these, are, these are interesting things to do and you will also learn how to uh, play around with the code. So these are the suggestions I have, but you are really um, uh, free to choose and to, um, to, you can build groups and work in groups or work alone. And we will, we will help you in all these, these subjects or also the subjects you choose. Good, so I will stop here and then we can continue tomorrow for the last part of the talk. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Farka. Do we have a questions? So I have a question. So how to uh, determine the sum problem in the TV model, especially in two dimensions? How to determine the what? Sum problem uh, for the TV model. I don't understand. To, the, to determine the what? The critical V? The, no, no, the, no, no. I, the spin I is the spin is TV model. So right. uh, how, how to determine uh, whether there's a sun problem? A sun problem. Uh -huh. Oh, sun problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sun problem. Okay, so, so for the TV model, um, it's, um, it's a bit tricky. I, 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 can, I, can, um, I can show you how to do that. Um, so for the for the TV model, you you um, there is a so this is the this is the trick. Um, if you do so, you have c dagger of i c of j plus Hermitian conjugate, right? That's the kinetic energy minus t, and then you have yeah. a minus um, v. So now I will I will write with the field right, which couples again to the hopping c dagger of i c of j plus Hermitian conjugate. Yes. Right. This is it. Right. So now, yes. um, so this is this is what this is the this is the this is sort of the Hamiltonian you have for a given field, and this will this is something which is time dependent. Right. You agree? Yes. Okay. So now, now you now what you can do is to go into a Majorana basis. Right. So this is H of five. Okay. And uh, the Majorana basis would be so you would have a so that that will be so gamma. Gamma i of one would be equal to a um, c dagger of i plus c of i, and gamma i of two would be equal to uh, to a one half when c dagger c of i minus c dagger of i. Right. So that's the imaginary part in the, the, the one over i. Right. Which I forgot. Oh. Sorry. Right. So that's something like that. Oh yes, I understand. Yeah, and and so so you have to be a bit careful in the choice. You will have to, you can choose this representation for sublattice A and another representation for sublattice B. But the, the upshot of all this is that if you write this in the Majorana representation, you have I and J, right? And this is then minus T um, and you will have an I, gamma dagger, no, there's no daggers in the gammas, gamma of I, N. So this is the real and imaginary card um, of J, N, right? And exactly the yeah. same thing or the phi of tau, and you will have a gamma of i n and gamma of j n with also an i, and I think there's a four, I forget, right? Okay, okay. so that's it. So, so the, beauty, you, the beautiful thing of this is that you see that there is, here you have a, just a u1 symmetry. I mean, so there, there, there's, not, there, there's not so much, but here you have an o2 symmetry, right? Okay, yeah. You have o2 symmetry, and essentially what that means is that the determinant, right, the determinant of the, of the of the m that is equal to the square of a Pathian. 
So if you take the if you if you trace if you trace over um, um, a um, Maharanas, you will get a Paphian, and so you will get the trace over a Paphian of this of this um, for, for this uh, for the gamma matrices, and you can show that this Paphian here is real. So that will be squared. Will be something which will real. If you take a real number, you square it, you get something which is bigger than zero. Okay. 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 You can do it. You can do different things. So this is a way to see it. You can use essentially also what um, Hong Yao has has proposed. You can define also um, some um, some symmetry, some anti-unitary, some some symmetry. So you could use, for example, let me have a mu which is an index mu which is a, a spin one half, um, basically a Pauli matrix which acts on the um, on the Majorana on the Majorana index, right? So what you could yeah. define is basically if I have a T, um, T, let's say this is a T minus in Hong Yao's notation, I think that's gamma of I, but I'll take this as a vector, a T at minus, minus one, that will be equal to, so I, I would give me an I mu Y, and then gamma of I and minus one to the I, right? You could use this as a, so that's an anti-unitary thing. And then you could use another one, which is a T plus alpha gamma of I T plus minus one. That would be alpha bar I mu, no, no I, that's wrong, mu X, mu X um, gamma of I. And there's also a minus one to the I, right? And so you can show that uh, essentially um, T, T plus squared is equal to one, T minus squared equal to minus one that uh, T plus um, commutes with the Hamiltonian, T minus commutes with the Hamiltonian, uh, that's equal to zero. And that T plus and T minus, they, they anti-commute. I think T plus and T minus is equal to zero. And this is basically a, a condition which is shown by Hong Yao, um, which, which will tell you if, you if you continue use this symmetry, then you will also see that the determinant of M is bigger than zero, okay? Okay. That's another way of seeing it. Uh, I, but the nice, the, the easiest way to see it is that the determinant decomposes into a square, which is the Paphian of a real quantity. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Also known in the chat. So think again, Faka, and we have now a very short break of a little more than five minutes before the second and last install installment of the tutorial starts. So talk to you then. <laughs>